We are surrounded by apologies, some more and some less earnestly meant. Politicians apologize all the time, usually on television. Six months later, they're back running for office. Convicted convicts buy a new suit, apologize profusely in front of the jury, hoping for a reduced sentence. And for those of you who are married, you might have discovered, like I have, we spend a lot of time apologizing to our spouses, not having quite realized when we were single how often we were in the wrong. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you today about a, a particularly extraordinary apology, because I think it'll help us understand the human costs of war at a time when politicians around the world seem to me a little bit too quick to resort, resort to the use of force to settle their national problems. The particular apology I have in mind is really quite extraordinary. It certainly surprised me when I heard it. First, let me give you a bit of background. I was a foreign correspondent for CBS News. And in 2010, Randall Joyce, a colleague of mine, and I decided to follow a battalion of US Marines, 1,000 strong, as they were being deployed to Helmand province in southern Afghanistan. 2010 was the height of the US war against Afghanistan, against the Taliban in Afghanistan. And it was, uh, Helmand was the most lethal province in the entire country. The Marines had a very tough time in Helmand. Uh, it was very hot. Temperatures are routinely above 120 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 50 degrees centigrade. No showers to be heard of. And the Taliban fought really hard to protect the fields that grew the opium down there, which funded their operations. And they did this by planting thousands and thousands of improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, under the ground. So everywhere the Marines went outside their bases, they had to scan the ground with these metal detectors uh, looking for, for these buried IEDs. They also used to, they had this habit, which we picked up on, they would also follow each other's footsteps in the dirt, so that if one person put a foot here, the next person would put his foot right on top of that. And Randall and I were very quick to, to copy that, that habit. Uh, when they found an IED, they would call the Explosive Ordnance Disposal Technicians, or EOD techs. And these guys, their, their, their only job was to either disable these bombs in place or to blow them up if they're too dangerous to touch. Um, and they were very popular with the Marines because they were removing the greatest threat that they had. We got to know one of these EOD techs pretty well. His name is Sergeant Johnny Jones. And at the time, he was a 28-year-old. He's from the state of Georgia. He was five years in the Marines. And we filmed him using robots to look at suspect wires or little lumps in the ground. Uh, we filmed him pulling jugs of homemade fertilizer explosive out of the ground once he disabled it. And we filmed him blowing up some of these devices that were simply too dangerous to, to go close to. <clears throat> to, go close to. Um, we got to know him pretty well. But then one afternoon, um, August 6, 2010, Johnny Jones stepped on an ID himself. He was behind a mud brick building in a little alleyway. A bomb in the ground, when it explodes, it explodes in a cone-shaped direction upwards. Johnny was right on top of the explosion, so it blew both his legs off. He lost both his legs instantly. It flipped him up in the air. He landed on his back. Um, the guy next to him, Corporal Daniel Greer, took the force of the explosion in his head and it took half his skull off, and he was later to die of those injuries. Uh, Johnny also took, took some shrapnel in the face, which swole, uh, swole up the, the soft tissue around his eyes, so his eyes were swollen shut, and temporarily he couldn't, couldn't see anything, but he knew his eyes were gone. The Marines sent out an emergency radio call. Um, stretchers quickly arrived. They brought him and the other wounded back to the mobile trauma bay as they waited for the helicopter to come in. We were filming all this as it, as it happened. Um, the uh, commander of the Marines down there was a lieutenant colonel. And while they were waiting for this helicopter to arrive, uh, he went in to, uh, <clears throat> to see Johnny. And he put his hand out, he took his hand, and he said, um, how are you doing, son? And the first words that Johnny Jones said were, sorry, I screwed up, sir. And when I heard those words, I really didn't know what to think. And frankly, even today, I hadn't really worked out what was going on in his mind, because I couldn't see why he would be apologizing. He, he, uh, he just lost his legs. Um, he's apologizing for disturbing the mission or for maybe the other guys who were hurt, apologizing for the medevac that they'd have to call in to get him out back to Germany and then to the United States for the months and months of follow-up surgeries, the prosthetics he'd have to get, the medications, lifelong disability payments that the US taxpayer would have to pay. It seems to me absurd this guy would be apologizing. And it's not that, I'm not making a comment here about the war, whatever we believe about the invasion of Afghanistan, uh, one way or another, he was just doing his job. He was trying to protect his comrades from these, these lethal explosions. 
or these nasal bombs. Um, so they, they airlifted him out, airlifted him out, and he was, it took him quite a while to, to recover. Um, we brought this footage back to New York, to CBS News, and I was completely shocked when they said they didn't want to use it. They said it was too gruesome for the viewers to watch, and we'd pixelated it, so it wasn't very gory, but too gruesome, and I think the unspoken truth was it was too gruesome for their advertisers to, to show. The bigger lesson I took from this was, actually nobody really wanted to own the human costs of these wars. And the human costs are enormous, not just on the soldiers, but on the civilians. In many ways, more civilians get hurt than, than, than soldiers. The politicians who unapologetically call for armed intervention in wherever it might be, Syria, Ukraine, South Sudan, South China Sea, name it, they're very quick to, to, to rally to the cause, but they're not around afterwards to say sorry to the wounded or the families of the dead. In fact, we're actually moving in the opposite direction. We're, we're developing this concept of painless, anonymous wars, which are prosecuted by robots and drones and by apparently invulnerable small teams of high-tech special operators or you know, by suicide bombers who are going to paradise or IEDs that are left in the ground and don't go off for weeks or months until somebody, civilian or military, steps on them. There's nobody there to apologize then. This is an anonymous uh, act of violence, if you like. So I'm here today to tell you I've seen a lot of wars in my career. There is no such thing as an anonymous civilian casualty or military casualty. Wars hurt. Wars hurt a lot of people. And I think it's incumbent on, on everyone who's uh, military or, or, or political, religious leader, as they're thinking about making that bellicose speech calling for military intervention, to think long and hard about the potential costs of what they're calling for. I'm not saying that all wars are wrong. Uh, probably few people would dispute we should have fought against Hitler. But it's something we need to think really hard about before we commit military force. Really hard. We had that long and hard talk with CBS News, with our producers. We very forcibly made the argument that it's the media's duty to remind people about the human cost of war. And we won that argument finally, and they showed the footage, suitably pixelated, um, and the series actually won an Emmy. Johnny Jones, like so many other casualties of war, still hurts, hurts a lot. He's still on pain medication. He struggles with his prosthetics. Um, he's left the Marines. He went back to university on the GI Bill, and now he's working for a nonprofit, helping other wounded veterans to adapt back to life after the military. He also works hard at staying fit. Um, and in two years after his accident, he and I uh, ran the Marine Corps Marathon through the st streets of Washington, D.C. together. Uh, he was in a handcart. His stump still hadn't healed properly. He couldn't run. So he had this handcart, which he powered with his arms. Um, I trained hard, and I ran a, what I thought was a pretty good time. I came in at a four, under four hours. Johnny finished one hour and 50 minutes ahead of me. <laughs> and when I crossed the finishing line, and I saw him with this big grin on his face, I finally got it. No apology required. Thank you very much. <laughs>